Europe, Germany, Frankfurt, May 3rd, 1937. The LZ-129 Hindenburg, the largest flying machine ever built, emerges from its hangar. Its destination, Lakehurst, New Jersey. This is no ordinary crossing. It's the launch of the world's first scheduled flight service across the Atlantic. Since rolling out of the hangar in March 1936, the airship has made a series of 62 successful trial and publicity flights. Built by the Zeppelin Company, the Hindenburg is 245 meters long, as big as an ocean liner, and stands as tall as a 13-story building. The 36 passengers boarding tonight will spend the flight on the passenger deck towards the airship's nose. Most are high-profile businessmen, but also on the passenger list is one of the first families ever to fly in the Hindenburg, Hermann and Matilda Derner, and their three children, Irena, Walter and Werner. The wealthy family live 11,000 kilometers away in Mexico and are returning from a vacation in their German homeland. For eight-year-old Werner, flying in an airship is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. The Zeppelins in general was the word of the day and it was the fancy way to go. Airships are considered the cruise liners of the future, but for now they are the sole preserve of the seriously wealthy. A one-way ticket costs $400, that's over $5,000 in today's money. It buys the ultimate luxury travel experience a restaurant serving cordon bleu cuisine and the finest wines, fashionably designed lounge areas, and of course, spectacular views from the promenade deck. Then a sister, Irena, is 14. For her, the voyage is a chance to leave childhood behind and mix in sophisticated adult circles for the first time. It was sort of special for her. Somehow, during this trip, she grew up enough so that she asked her blades to be cut and she had a new hairdo and well, she was now a young lady. Down on the ground, a crowd gathers to watch the launch. For many, just seeing this massive flying machine up close is a thrilling experience. As passengers board, all their lighters and matches are confiscated and they are expressly forbidden from straying outside the designated passenger areas. With good reason. The airship's outer skin is made of strong cotton and linen, waterproofed and tightened with a chemical paint called dope. Inside the skin are 16 gas bags, over 30 meters tall, holding nearly 200,000 cubic meters of hydrogen, a highly flammable, lighter-than-air gas that gives the airship its lift. Forward of the passenger deck, slung beneath the airship, is its nerve center, the control car. In command is Max Pruce. He's one of the company's most experienced captains with over 20 years flying experience. And he's captained the Hindenburg on 22 flights. 8.15 p.m. Right on schedule, Captain Pruce orders the ground crew to release the landing ropes. Ship more. The flight crew dumps 590 kilograms of water ballast and the airship begins to rise. When it reaches 60 meters, the crew starts up the four 1100 horsepower diesel-fueled propeller engines. On the passenger deck, the Derners wave goodbye to friends and family below. For Matilda Derner, leaving her homeland once again, it's a poignant moment. I remember my mother had tears in her eyes when, when the ship lifted. That was so seldom for her. I, I can hardly remember her seeing tears in her eyes any time. Within minutes, the Hindenburg reaches its top speed of 125 kilometers per hour. The 6,500 kilometer voyage should take just two and a half days, just over half the time taken by a ship. Its flight path will take it over Holland, down the English Channel, and across the Atlantic to America's east coast. 
The Zeppelin company is sending its head of operations, Ernst Lehmann, to oversee this critical flight. Lehmann is an enthusiastic supporter of Germany's ruling Nazi party. He's on board to ensure the Hindenburg stays on schedule. Any delays would be deeply embarrassing. But as Lehmann knows, the Hindenburg has an Achilles heel, bad weather. Strong winds can blow the airship off course. They also make its complex landing maneuvers more difficult. A bad storm could even put the airship in danger. In 1930, the pride of the British Empire, the R101 airship, was en route to India. It hit a storm over France and went down nose first. The resulting crash killed 48 of the 54 people on board. The tragedy ended the British airship program. Between 1925 and 1935, the US Navy lost three of its airships in severe weather. By 1937, only one, the Los Angeles, is still in service. Assistant cabin steward Werner Franz isn't worried. The Zeppelin company has a 100% safety record in 27 years of flying passenger airships. And 14-year-old Werner knows that in hard times like this, he's lucky to have a job. I was very proud to be part of the crew and to go on all those journeys to see all those countries. My father was out of work at the time and we had very little money. To be part of this, it, it was incredible. But there's a new threat facing passengers and crew on the Hindenburg today. Under Germany's dictator, Adolf Hitler, the Nazis are rearming for war. They are also brutally suppressing all opposition at home. The Hindenburg's construction was part funded by Hitler, and it's become a powerful Nazi propaganda tool. But the airship's iconic status also makes it the target for opponents of the Nazi regime. In 1933, the Reichstag, the Nazi-controlled German parliament, was burned to the ground. The authorities blamed saboteurs. And now, just days ago, German authorities warned Ernst Lehmann that they'd received a specific threat to this crucial flight. Could saboteurs posing as innocent passengers or even crew members be on board with a deadly mission to destroy the Hindenburg? Wednesday, May 5th, day three. Ernst Lehmann, Zeppelin head of operations, and Captain Proust are worried. The Hindenburg should be making 125 kilometers per hour, but strong headwinds mean the schedule is slipping. At this rate, they'll be 12 hours late. Joseph Spar, a German living in Long Island, New York, is just a day away from a reunion with his family. He's been touring Germany with his music hall act of acrobatics and slapstick comedy. His next performance will be at Radio City Music Hall in New York. He's taking a dog home as a surprise for his children. It's spending the flight in the freight area on a lower deck. Spar needs to feed the dog regularly, but it's in a restricted area so he's been warned that he has to be escorted by a crew member. Ernst Lehmann, Captain Proust, and a Zeppelin company observer are the only three on board aware of the sabotage threat to the Hindenburg. It's not the first time the airship has been threatened, so they treat it as a false alarm. And reassuringly, there are plainclothes intelligence officers on board, on the lookout for anyone acting suspiciously. But Captain Proust has another problem. They're still battling against strong headwinds, so they're still 12 hours behind schedule. Arriving late is bad enough, but the return flight to Frankfurt the following night is an important one, and it's fully booked. The airship will be packed with high society passengers flying to attend the coronation of King George VI in London. It's the event of the year. If the Hindenburg doesn't get the guests to Europe in time, Lehman faces a PR disaster. The passengers finish their after-dinner drinks and retire to their cabins. It's their last night on the Hindenburg. In a few hours, they'll be in New Jersey. Werner Franz grabs a few hours sleep. Tomorrow he's going to be busy preparing the airship for its return trip. Thursday, May 6th, 6 a.m. The Hindenburg should be landing at Lakehurst Naval Base. 
but it's still 1,130 kilometers away. The estimated arrival time is 6 p.m., 12 hours behind schedule. Lehman and Proust should have 16 hours to land the airship, disembark the passengers and freight, and complete refueling and reprovisioning before heading back to Europe at 10 p.m. Today, they'll only have four hours. It's going to be tight. 2 p.m. Mrs. Derner packs the family's bags. On the passenger deck, Joseph Spar can't wait to see his wife and children. He knows how thrilled they'll be when they see the dog he's bought for them. The Hindenburg approaches New York, just 80 kilometers northeast of their destination. Captain Proust treats the passengers to a bird's eye view of the Manhattan skyline. From a crew lookout area at the top of the airship, 14-year-old cabin boy Werner Franz marvels at his first glimpse of the new world. We approach New York, this sea of buildings, the Statue of Liberty, the skyscrapers. All that was something I'd never seen before. 3 p.m. The Hindenburg appears out of the clouds over the airfield at Lakehurst. Base commander Charles Rosendahl watches the giant airship pass over the hangar. He's a veteran airship commander with 13 years flying experience. And he's worried. A thunderstorm is developing and winds are picking up. Landing an airship is a delicate operation requiring accurate maneuvering. Attempting it in bad weather could end in disaster. Rosendahl radios Captain Proust. He recommends delaying the landing until the conditions improve. Radio this to the Hindenburg. There it is. Proust has no choice but to turn the airship away. He heads southwest to await a break in the weather. Proust and Lehman know that any chance of making the 10 p.m. departure is rapidly disappearing. But first, Proust must focus on landing the airship. 5.12 p.m. At Lakehurst, the wind eases. Commander Rosendahl radios the Hindenburg. He tells Proust, conditions now suitable for landing. Ground crew is ready. Captain Proust turns the airship back towards Lakehurst, but it encounters increasingly heavy rain, which slows its progress. The passengers make for the promenade areas for the final moments of the flight. 6.11 p.m. Captain Proust swings the airship round to land into the wind, the safest way of landing. 6.13 p.m. Suddenly, the wind veers to the southeast. Proust has to think fast. He can abort and go round the airfield to line up with the wind. But this will lose precious time. Captain Proust decides to land straight away. But this means he must turn the airship into the wind fast. He orders the crew to make a sharp left turn. 6.17 p.m. Now Captain Proust notices the ship is heavy at the rear. He must balance the airship before landing or he risks damaging the tail. He orders over 1,000 kilograms of ballast from the ship's water tanks to be jettisoned. 6.19 p.m. Proust orders a final sharp right turn to line up with the mast. The airship is still sloping to the rear. Proust orders six crew members from their mess hall in the rear to come to the nose of the ship to add more weight at the front. 6.20 p.m. The airship finally arrives at the landing area. They slow and hover over the airfield. A crowd gathers to witness the Hindenburg's first landing in America this year. Newsreel teams record the arrival, hoping to get some exciting pictures of the airship's landing procedure. Now all that remains is for the crew to lower a cable from the nose to the mooring mast. The ground crew will then winch the Hindenburg down to the mast. Before lowering the mooring cable, Bruce must first drop two anchor ropes. These are held by the ground crew to stop the airship drifting. 6.21 p.m. The first anchor rope drops to the ground, closely followed by the second. 6.25 p.m. Suddenly, the crowds on the ground see flames appear around the fin. 
Then the airship's nose rears up. Tables and chairs slide backwards. Passengers tumble down. Werner Derner feels the air turn to a furnace-like heat. Suddenly the air was on fire. In an instant the whole thing was on fire. The world's largest flying machine is now a blazing inferno. 97 people, including the three Derner children, are trapped inside the Hindenburg, 60 meters above the ground. 36 passengers are just moments from disembarking from the Hindenburg when disaster strikes. In the control car, the crew feel a massive jolt. An officer shouts, the ship's on fire. The nose rears up over 100 meters above the ground. The fire roars through the airship. Within seconds, the Hindenburg is engulfed in flames. Werner Franz is trapped on the walkway on the lower deck. He must find a way out before the flames reach him. So what? Right away, this bang told you that a major catastrophe had happened. You knew right away the airship was lost. The airship was burning and couldn't be saved. Werner stumbles along the gangway, looking for a way out, but he trips and falls. He grabs the rope handrail and holds on. As I was hanging onto these ropes, everything I had experienced in my life came back as if it were a film. Werner sits on the gangway and kicks through the canvas. He jumps out of the blazing airship and onto the ground five meters below. Gripped with fear, he runs away into the arms of a fellow crew member. I lost control and started screaming, and he put me right again, saying, What's the matter? You're all right, aren't you? Control yourself. Go and see if you can help someone. But Werner is too terrified to return into the flaming wreckage. These half-burned creatures came running past me. Nothing could persuade me to go back into the airship. The fire rushes up the airship. The Derners are still in the passenger lounge. If they don't get out now, they'll burn. But they're still nine meters up. Matilda Derner shouts to her 14-year-old daughter, Irena, to jump out of the window. But the girl is too frightened. Mrs. Derner picks up her eight-year-old son, Werner. She tries to throw him out of the window, but he falls back. Somehow, she finds the strength to lift him again. This time, she succeeds, and Werner falls to the ground with his brother. She turns to her daughter again, pleading with her to jump. But Irena is paralyzed with fear and instead turns away towards the flames looking for her father. In desperation, Mrs. Derner jumps out after her sons. Acrobat Joseph Spa also jumps from the passenger lounge. He rolls onto the grass, picks himself up and limps away but he's unable to rescue his dog, which perishes in the fire. 34 seconds after the first flame appears, the Hindenburg is consumed by the inferno. The wreckage crashes to the ground. It's totally destroyed. Ambulances rush survivors to hospital. Werner Derner and his mother are severely injured. His brother, Walter, suffers minor burns. But his father dies inside the airship. A crewman rescues Werner's sister, Irena, from the burning wreckage, but she's close to death. My sister's condition was so bad that they had taken to her to a different place, inside the hospital, probably in intensive care. My mother very much complained about being separated from her daughter. In the morning, doctors bring Matilda Derner news. Her daughter, Irena, died in the night from her burns. She was just 14 years old. My mother was very much upset with the authorities in the hospital that she never got to see her again. But that was probably the best thing because she must have been in very bad shape. Captain Proust survives but is badly burned. 
Ernst Lehmann is fatally injured. Of the 97 people on board, 29 are dead. One ground crewman perishes. Another six people die in hospital. But what caused this tragedy? The Germans have a 100% safety record operating passenger airships. And the Hindenburg was a state-of-the-art aircraft. The pride of the Third Reich. The United States and Germany open a joint inquiry. They interview the surviving crew members and passengers. They take testimonies from over 90 eyewitnesses. But in 1937, there is very little cockpit technology to conduct a conclusive crash investigation. And in the 68 years since the disaster, many different theories, some highly controversial, have emerged. Debate still rages today over what really downed the celebrated airship. Now, Seconds from Disaster re-examines the investigation into the loss of the Hindenburg. Using modern-day forensics and scientific experiments, we will finally solve the mystery. What was it that started the fire aboard the Hindenburg? Could it have been an act of sabotage? And what really fueled the blaze so that it consumed the whole ship in 34 seconds? Advanced computer simulation will take us where no camera can go into the heart of the disaster zone. Greg Fife is one of the United States' most experienced crash detectives. He has 20 years of service with the National Transportation Safety Board. For eight of those, he was the investigator in charge of the team that attends every major crash site in America, known as the GO Team. He's worked on some of the world's most complex and baffling air crashes. And so far, he's solved every one of them. But there's one disaster he's always wanted to explore. The Hindenburg mystery has intrigued me just because you had this magnificent flying machine that fell into a major disaster, a very cataclysmic disaster, and nobody really had an idea of what caused it. But Fife brings a modern crash investigator's expertise and forensic skills to the disaster. He must keep an open mind as he investigates every possible reason for the crash. In any major explosion in a modern aircraft, all eyes immediately turn to terrorism. Anytime you have an in-flight fire, you have to think the worst. You have to try and determine what led to that in-flight fire. You go to the extreme, and the extreme is sabotage. Fife learns that the Hindenburg received many sabotage threats in its one year of operations. But who would want to destroy it? Rick Zitarosa is vice president of the Lakehurst Historical Society and a specialist in the Hindenburg era. As the Nazi regime became increasingly unpopular throughout the world, it was also going to face a new set of security concerns. And there were heightened uh, fears that perhaps an act of sabotage could be carried out against the airship. Greg Feith examines the original report for evidence of sabotage warnings. He finds that Ernst Lehmann received intelligence from the German authorities warning of a specific threat. But who had a motive? Hitler and his Nazi party had many enemies in Germany. They carried out a brutal policy of repression against Jewish people, socialists, communists, and outspoken writers. Any one of these people might have been happy to see the Hindenburg destroyed. Feith checks the official reports and finds the one passenger who could have had the opportunity to destroy the Hindenburg. Joseph Spa. After the crash, Spa comes under intense scrutiny. He lives in America with his wife and family, but he is German. And for the last few months, he's been traveling all over Europe. This is just the sort of background that rings alarm bells with German intelligence. According to the FBI report, Joseph Spa did act suspiciously. In fact, Spa accessed high security areas where no passengers were allowed, apparently, to visit his dog. The fact that Spa is an acrobat with great agility means he could easily climb in and around the Hindenburg's narrow passageways. Could Spa have used his dog as a cover to plant a bomb? Was this music hall clown really a ruthless terrorist, responsible for the destruction of the Hindenburg and the deaths of 36 people? Air crash investigator Greg Fife is trying to get to the bottom of one of aviation's great mysteries. Why did the Hindenburg airship burst into flames and crash at Lakehurst Naval Base in 1937? 
Many of the crew and officers of the Hindenburg were convinced the cause was sabotage. Feith wants to see if the theory stands up. He finds an intriguing statement in the report about one of the passengers. Acrobat, Joseph Spa, did disappear into unauthorized areas where the fuel tanks were kept on several occasions on his own. He told the crew he was going to check on his dog. Could he actually have been looking for somewhere to plant a bomb? Fife knows that the FBI investigated Spa and was unable to find any motive. But he wants to put Spa's actions aboard the airship under the microscope himself. He studies the film footage. He reads eyewitness reports. They state that the fire started at the top of the airship near the vertical fin. For Spa to reach this area, he would have to climb up a 30-meter shaft. Even with his acrobatic agility, this would take several minutes. And he would have to somehow avoid being challenged by the many crewmen patrolling this area. And if he were caught, he could hardly claim to be feeding his dog when it was stored in the freight area at the foot of the airship. Why would he have taken so many risks when he had ample opportunity to plant a bomb here, which would have had just as deadly an effect? Fight decides it's too far-fetched and rules Spa out as the potential saboteur. So, if it's not a terrorist act, what else could set the airship on fire? The joint reports state that a spark ignites leaking hydrogen that consumes the airship in 34 seconds. Hydrogen certainly seems the obvious culprit. It's highly flammable when mixed with air, and the Hindenburg had 16 gas cells with a total of 200,000 cubic meters of hydrogen. But in nearly 70 years since the accident, many experts have cast doubt on the idea that hydrogen was the fatal accelerant in the fire. The Germans were aware of the dangers of hydrogen, so they took every possible precaution. All passenger cigarette lighters and matches are confiscated at the start of the voyage as a fire precaution. And hydrogen can only ignite when mixed with air. Fife shifts his attention to some recent theories. Some experts claim that leaking diesel fuel caught fire first, and only then hydrogen once the fire had spread. Fife studies the Hindenburg blueprints. There are 88,000 liters of diesel stored in tanks at the bottom of the airship. The fuel lines run from the tanks to the four exterior mounted engines. Could there have been a fuel leak in one of these lines? Looking back through the Hindenburg's flying history, he comes across a statement made by an American observer. Harold Dick, an engineer working for the U.S. airship company Goodyear, was invited by the Germans to attend the trial flights in 1936. On one of these, he noticed a strong smell of diesel in the keel, or bottom of the airship. Greg Fife finds that on a later flight, Dick notes that the main fuel lines do not seem to be particularly tight. This fuel leak theory now looks attractive to Fife, but he needs to know if there was a fuel leak, what ignited it? The most likely cause would be a short circuit in the electrical cables creating a spark. But Fife isn't convinced that a spark would ignite diesel. He knows that diesel has a high flash point. It must reach nearly 65 degrees Celsius before it'll catch fire. If there were a diesel leak, it would have to be heated up to that point before a spark could ignite it. Fife studies the airship plans to see if there is any point where diesel comes into contact with a heat source. He finds just one, the engine rooms. This is the hottest point the fuel passes through before feeding the 1,100 horsepower engines. But there's a problem. The engines are all externally mounted, suspended below the airship. If a fire had started here, then eyewitnesses on the ground would have clearly seen it. Instead, they all report that the fire started at the top of the ship. To have a fire ignite on the bottom of the airship, propagate through the entire diameter of the airship, and then exit out the top in a very short period of time without anyone noticing is very remote. Greg Fife rules out a diesel leak as the cause of the blaze that engulfed the Hindenburg. Now he turns to the other prominent theory for the blaze. Not something inside the ship, but its outer skin. 
The outer covering is a cotton linen material painted with a chemical known as dope that waterproofs the airship and protects the gas bags from the heat of the sun's rays. The dope used on the Hindenburg was a new type of paint called cellulose acetate butyrate. This dope is more flammable than previous paints. The paint theory states that somehow the skin of the airship caught fire. The Hindenburg burned fast. The footage reveals that the fire swept through the entire airship in just 34 seconds. Would the doped outer cover really be so flammable? When you look at the fabric that was used to cover the Hindenburg, it's a cotton linen material. So on its own, of course, it's flammable. But it was impregnated with this doping material. And while it too has some flammable capability or characteristics to it, can it burn that fast is the big question. Fife decides to conduct an experiment to test the paint theory. He prepares a sample of the outer cover. It's made from exactly the same type of linen cotton material. The cloth is doped with a mixture of iron oxide powder and aluminium powder, just like the skin of the Hindenburg. If the material is the accelerant, this experiment will prove it. For safety, the test is done outside. If there's any wind, it's likely to push the flame in one direction faster than the other. So to compensate for this, he uses two stopwatches to time the burn. Go. As soon as the flame reaches the edge of the inner circle, he starts the clocks. When the flames reach the outer edge, he stops the clocks. One minute for the wind-assisted side, and one minute and eight seconds for the flame to travel against the wind. Both much too slow. The Hindenburg, all 245 meters, burns in 34 seconds. At the burn rate Fife's time, the Hindenburg would have taken 40 hours to be destroyed. Greg Fife concludes the outer skin cannot be the fatal accelerant. So what did burn the Hindenburg? Was the original report right after all? Was it the hydrogen? From the investigative standpoint, you have to wonder what can burn that quickly and literally take an 800-foot tube and, and destroy it in a matter of seconds. Fight Commission's Professor Nick Syred, a mechanical engineer with 30 years' experience specializing in combustion rates, to calculate if it was hydrogen that burned the Hindenburg. The airship was 245 meters long. Professor Syred knows from scientific study that hydrogen can burn at a rate of nine meters per second. I make calculations of the flame speed of hydrogen and it's perfectly consistent then within about 30 seconds or so that uh, a flame can engulf the whole of the Hindenburg. There is nothing else on the airship which can burn that quickly and cause the Hindenburg to be uh, destroyed in the uh, same period of time. Greg Fife concludes that hydrogen is the fatal accelerant for the fire that tore through the Hindenburg, consuming it in 34 seconds. But the hydrogen would have had to escape to mix with air before it could become flammable. Trawling through the witness testimonies, he finds something that could suggest a hydrogen leak. Eyewitnesses on the ground notice a fluttering at the top of the airship near the vertical fin just before the fire starts. Could they be seeing escaped hydrogen pushing against the outer envelope? The original report concluded this may have been the case. But Fife wants to find out how the hydrogen could leak out. He studies the composition of the gas cells. They're made of a special plastic film sandwiched between two layers of thick cotton. It would take considerable force to rupture these cells. Is there anything on the airship capable of causing such damage? Next, Fife focuses on the Hindenburg's bracing wires. Thousands of cables that are vital to the overall strength of the machine. There are over 200 kilometers of wire bracing the airframe. They're each about three millimeters thick, made of steel, similar to piano wire, with a breaking stress of 450 kilograms. Is it possible for one of these wires to snap? He checks the maintenance records and finds out that bracing wires have snapped on airships in the past. Fife examines the Hindenburg's final journey to find out if anything could have put the airship under structural stress. 
He first checks the weather conditions. The airship battled strong headwinds all the way across the Atlantic. But according to the flying logs, it had flown through worse conditions in the past. But examining the last moments of the flight, Fife finds a critical clue. Shortly before the fire, the Hindenburg makes its final approach. Then, suddenly, the wind changes direction, and Captain Proust orders the crew to make a sharp left turn. Finally, Proust orders another sharp turn, this time to the right, to line up with the mooring mast. But would these tight turns snap a bracing wire? Fife checks the design plans and finds that the Hindenburg wasn't designed to make sharp turns. As the airship turns, it generates sideways pressure on the tail fin. The Hindenburg is 245 meters long. If it turns too sharply, it could put too much stress on the airframe. A bracing wire could snap under this kind of tension. In a tight turn, the greatest stress on the airship is just forward of the tail fin. And Fife knows from eyewitness reports that this is where the fire probably started. If a wire did snap, the whiplash effect would be so violent it could slash through the gas bag's protective covering. And Fife also realizes that the airship may have been leaning to the rear as a result of hydrogen leaking from a cell. They did have some support tension wires that had broken in the past, and because that the captain was making very hard turns left and right, it could have caused one of those tension straps to break, slice the hole in that gas bag to allow the hydrogen to leak out. Greg Fife concludes that a snapped bracing wire caused the fatal leak of hydrogen. But this doesn't explain what could have ignited the escaping hydrogen. He studies the weather conditions at the time of the accident. The report states there was light rain over the airfield. A thunderstorm had recently passed by. There was lightning still visible to the south of Lakehurst. Although no one saw lightning strike the airship, these conditions create a highly charged electrical atmosphere. Could this have somehow caused the critical spark? It was well understood at the time that as an airship passes through the air, it gathers tens of thousands of volts of static electricity, just like a party balloon being rubbed on a sweater. The effect is increased in thundery conditions. While it remains aloft, the ship is in no danger, since the entire machine, the aluminium skeleton and the outer skin are all at the same level of charge. But all that changes when one part of the ship touches the ground. And Fife can see from the film footage exactly how that happened. In the final stages of landing, the crew drop the first mooring ropes. The rain makes the ropes wet, and once they're wet, the charge from the airship's metal frame now rapidly flows through the ropes to the ground. Instantly, the airframe voltage falls to zero. But the airship's outer cover is made of a linen-cotton mixture that does not conduct electricity so easily, and it remains at high voltage the perfect conditions for generating a spark between the skin and the frame. Greg Fife now knows how the spark that ignited the hydrogen was generated. He can now unravel what happened aboard the Hindenburg in those final, fateful seconds from disaster. 14 minutes before the fire, the Hindenburg begins its final approach. Static electricity builds up on the ship, spread evenly throughout the structure. Eleven minutes to go. Without warning, the wind changes direction. Instead of going around the airfield in a wide sweep, Captain Proust, anxious to land the airship as soon as possible, makes a sharp left turn. Stressed by this sudden maneuver, somewhere near gas cell 4, a bracing wire snaps. The gas cell ruptures and hydrogen begins to leak out. Eight minutes before the catastrophe, Captain Proust notices that the ship is tail heavy. He orders the crew to dump water to balance the ship. Then Proust orders another sharp turn, this time to the right, to line up with the mooring mast. The ship is still tail heavy. Captain Proust orders six crew members to walk to the nose to try to counterbalance the sloping tail. 
but Bruce is too concerned with landing to realize that the airship may be leaning as a result of hydrogen leaking. Four minutes left. The Hindenburg comes to a stop and the crew drop the mooring ropes. Eyewitnesses on the ground notice a fluttering effect near the tail fin. They don't know it, but what they're seeing is leaking hydrogen pouring out of the doomed machine. By 6.25 p.m., due to falling rain, the ropes are now wet. The electrical charge flows from the metal part of the airship to the ground. The aircraft's skin, less conductive than the metal, is still highly charged from a combination of the journey and the atmospheric conditions. It's now at a dangerously high voltage. Seeking the quickest way to the ground, a spark jumps from the outer skin to the metal, igniting the leaking hydrogen. The fire roars through the airship as 200,000 cubic meters of hydrogen in the 16 cells catch fire. 34 seconds later, the mighty Hindenburg is destroyed. 36 people are killed. But Greg Feith still has one piece of the puzzle to solve. How could the Hindenburg fire have been bright orange when hydrogen burns with an invisible flame? Greg Fife has concluded that the Hindenburg was destroyed after a spark caused by the thunderstorm conditions in the atmosphere ignited leaking hydrogen. But he still has one question. He knows that hydrogen burns with an invisible flame. And yet eyewitnesses stated that the Hindenburg burned with a bright orange glow. How could hydrogen burn this way? Fife sets up another experiment. He sets light to a stream of hydrogen. There's no visible flame. But as soon as he places some cloth in the hydrogen flame, the fire is visible. Hydrogen burns clear. That's not what the folks saw when they were observing the actual fire. The fire that they saw was the material, that covering material that finally ignited and burned. Going through the papers, Greg Feith realizes the tragedy could have been averted. He finds that the Zeppelin company had strict regulations governing landing procedures. In fact, in their training, crews were warned against landing in thunderstorm conditions. He learns that Dr. Eckener, the chairman of the company, blamed Captain Proust and Ernst Lehmann for the accident. Dr. Eckner felt very much that it was pilot error. When he learned of the landing conditions, he was appalled and he was infuriated. He unequivocally held that the landing never should have been carried out as it was under those conditions. But Bruce is under pressure to land as fast as possible, to try and make up time on the schedule. He also has Ernst Lehmann, Zeppelin's director of operations in the control car with him. He too is anxious to keep to the schedule. Instead of aborting the landing and waiting for better weather, they try to land in dangerous atmospheric conditions. Lehman most definitely did influence Proust in his decisions regarding the flight, which of course was increasingly held up by headwinds and then the delayed landing. The Hindenburg disaster spells the end of the commercial airship age. Germany grounds her other passenger airship, the Graf Zeppelin, until they can use the non-flammable helium as a lifting gas. But with Europe on the brink of war, the United States, the only country with helium supplies, refuses to sell the gas to Germany. And when war does break out, the Nazis cancel the airship program completely. But valuable lessons are learned from the disaster. Hydrogen has never been used again to lift passenger airships. Today, all airships are filled with helium. Directly after the Hindenburg crash, the Zeppelin company design a thunder car. This machine, located at their Frankfurt airfield, measures the electrical activity in the atmosphere. It's a breakthrough in collecting accurate data on thunderstorm conditions. And today, understanding of weather is at the forefront of all aviation safety. Nearly 70 years later, there are just two known remaining survivors from the tragedy. Cabin boy Werner Franz is now 83 years old. After the crash, he trained as an engineer. But the memories of that day stayed with him. It took quite some time to calm down again. 
Those impressions stayed with me for a long time. I did suffer from it for a long time, to have been confronted with this. Werner Döner returned to Mexico with his family. Now age 75, he lives in the United States. Although he lost his father and sister, he believes the crash had a positive effect on him. I wonder what my life would have been without it. I was a spoiled brat. It made me probably a better person than what I would have been without it. The Hindenburg is still the largest flying machine ever built. Today's air travelers may fly across the Atlantic in a few hours, but the luxury and style the Hindenburg passengers experienced will probably never be surpassed. Sri Travel Experience. A restaurant serving cordon bleu cuisine and the finest wines. Fashionably designed lounge areas. And of course, spectacular views from the promenade deck. Werner's sister, Irena, is 14. For her, the voyage is a chance to leave childhood behind and mix in sophisticated adult circles for the first time. It was sort of special for her. Somehow, during this trip, she grew up enough so that she asked her blades to be cut and she had a new hairdo. And well, she was now a young lady. Down on the ground, a crowd gathers to watch the launch. For many, just seeing this massive flying machine up close is a thrilling experience. As passengers board, all their lighters and matches are confiscated. Europe. Germany. Frankfurt. May 3rd, 1937. The LZ-129 Hindenburg, the largest flying machine ever built, emerges from its hangar. Its destination, Lakehurst, New Jersey. This is no ordinary crossing. It's the launch of the world's first scheduled flight service across the Atlantic. Since rolling out of the hangar in March 1936, the airship has made a series of 62 successful trial and publicity flights. Built by the Zeppelin Company, the Hindenburg is 245 meters long, as big as an ocean liner, and stands as tall as a 13-story building. The 36 passengers boarding tonight will spend the flight on the passenger deck to get it. And they are expressly forbidden from straying outside the designated passenger areas. With good reason. The airship's outer skin is made of strong cotton and linen, waterproofed and tightened with a chemical paint called dope. Inside the skin are 16 gas bags, over 30 meters tall, holding nearly 200,000 cubic meters of hydrogen a highly flammable, lighter-than-air gas that gives the airship its lift. Forward of the passenger deck, slung beneath the airship, is its nerve center, the control car. In command is Max Pruce. He's one of the company's most experienced captains with over 20 years flying experience. And he's captain the Hindenburg on 22 flights. 8.15 p.m. Right on schedule, Captain Pruce orders the ground crew to release the landing ropes. The flight crew dumps 590 kilograms of water ballast and the airship begins to rise. When it reaches 60 meters, the crew starts up the four 1100 horsepower diesel-fueled propeller engines. On the passenger deck, the Derners wave goodbye to friends and family below. For Matilda Derner, leaving her homeland once again, it's a poignant moment. I remember my mother had tears in her eyes when, when the ship lifted. That was so seldom for her. I, I can hardly remember her seeing tears in her eyes any time. Towards the airship's nose. Most a high-profile businessman. But also on the passenger list is one of the first families ever to fly in the Hindenburg. Hermann and Matilda Derner and their three children, Irena, Walter and Werner. The wealthy family live 11,000 kilometers away in Mexico and are returning from a vacation in their German homeland. 
For eight-year-old Werner, flying in an airship is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. The Zeppelins in general was the word of the day and it was the fancy way to go. Airships are considered the cruise liners of the future. But for now, they are the sole preserve of the seriously wealthy. A one-way ticket costs $400. That's over $5,000 in today's money. It buys the ultimate luxury.